Jim Pappas has uh, created a tradition of uh, doing a, uh, a, a very rapid, very concise overview of the entire uh, persistent memory and formerly NVME uh, summit um, in the past until uh, Jim's a big NVM summit. I'm sorry, NVM NVM summit. Humans are incapable. Yes. Without they are. You've trained them. Humor, humans are incapable of saying real-world workloads, too, which Eden did, so I think he's from outer space. Yes. <laughs> but Jim is a big guy, so we feel like we have big shoes to fill. So with that in mind, um, we're going to, uh, we're, we're, we're going to uh, try to explain some of the terms that are used uh, and the description. So the first one is, in Jim's opening remarks, um, so we used hydrazine and nitrogen hydroxide to create a hypergolic reaction, which allowed us to cross the Kármán line, except then we found out that we, could, uh, we had trouble with our system, and uh, so we fixed that uh, by a reminder of SCE to aux. Uh, what Tom really means to say is that he said that we had the eighth year of the uh, Persistent Memory Summit, um, and there was a good illustration of how latency uh, was uh, it, for if latency for PM was, was a bad thing if you went through the SSD interface or the hard drive interface. He also talked about how uh, Google Cloud and Azure have PM services now and that CXL should take over the role that DRAM interfaces are using today for persistent memory. But he said that everything is driven by fear, all of the advances in that. Our next speaker was uh, Andy Bechtelstein, Shy. who uh, said that if you use Rocky for your TCP IP interface with an NVMe over fabric, it becomes disaggregated and uh, the leaf spine becomes apart. Now what Jim meant is that 60 slides in 15 minutes, we think that Andy broke the land speed record, <laughs> which is probably appropriate for a high speed networking guy. Um, he talked about uh, 100G uh, switching chips being kind of a limit for right now because of uh, the difficulty in new technology. Um, but he said that if you uh, aggregate these together, you can get some really high speeds. He was even mentioning 800 gig, uh, gig Ethernet. Um, the, but it's, and the, the trick in the transitions to these uh, technologies, though, is a cheaper per bit for the network transactions and that optical lags wire networks. Who would have thought? <laughs> So, Andy Rudolph, uh, the persistent memory programming model. So I was uh, C-flushing my NVDIM uh, when I made it a, a P commit to do REDMA over a PMDK with my Perl. What, what Tom meant to say was that Andy was talking about how in uh, 10 minutes he was able to summarize eight years of persistent memory summits. And even though at the beginning of all of this uh, great labor, there were only two important P persistent memory papers, there are so many now that he couldn't even count them. Um, he did point out that even though we've made a lot of progress, there are certain places where there are snags, there are problems with security and the Linux implementation, and other than that, there's a lot more work that still needs to be done. So then our next speaker was Richard Bruner, who talked about persistent memory in the wild by explaining that DDR5 allowed the ACPI to do a UEFI over NVDIM ends with an upmem disk overlay. Now, what Jim is saying there is that uh, uh, he's been working on this since 2011. Um, and the basic capabilities are, are available now to support persistent memories. And vSphere 6.7 works with persistent memories. And in fact, there's a certification of persistent memory hardware. But he said it's very important that we focus on data protection. It's a, a, a mediation for one class of failure, he said, and this is very important, is to pray. So, uh, Soji uh, Den uh, Lo Loey uh, talked about persistent memory use cases, and if I murdered your name, I'm sorry. Um, so, I took my bucket cache, I filled it full of KVs, um, and then I went and uh, checked my bloom filter to see about the adaptive red X tree, but I found that it was covered with a Java wrapper. Yes, and so what Tom's trying to say is that what Soji's talked about were four use cases, caches, stores, and buffers or memory. 
uh, in which persistent memory worked out well, and that uh, there were good practices that could be used for cache that would end up working this very well. Uh, he gave details on Cassandra stores and how they got streamlined with uh, persistent memory, and I think it was his that had the nine times improvement. It did, yes. Yeah, which was a really compelling case. Um, and uh, he talked about the persistent use of persistent memory, and he persisted in talking about that. So, we thought that was important. Yeah. Now, the next speaker was Charles Fan, who spoke uh, about memory at storage scale by telling us that uh, the KDB pub slash sub was used in the terra sort to be a hypervisor. And again, Jim, is what he's really saying is uh, he's doing for persistent memory what virtual memory did for multi-core processors. And uh, Memverge, he said, is a first mover in this market. So they think there's going to be other people following behind them that, uh, you know, are creating a new market here. And by 2025, persistent memory will be mainstream. And he wants to hire a marketing person to give his product a name. So again, a reminder of that. <laughs> so uh, Piotr. Uh, Balser, and again, if I killed your name, I'm sorry, uh, talked about the evolution of, of the persistent memory uh, de uh, development kit. Um, and uh, there's some very interesting terms here. Uh, uh, the, I took my uh, uh, live vmem kv uh, and also my uh, live vmem obj ca uh, cap and my uh, live vmem obj, um, but I did not take my uh, live vmem BLK or my live BMM log because I wanted to save that for my live BMM cache and just in case I was traveling in time I wanted to do that with a non-temporal store. Uh, what, what Tom means by that is that there were seven valuable lessons that he gave for programmers. Um, and I'm not going to recount every single one of them but he went through a chronology of processes going from um, a very verbose uh, 0.0.1 .0 implementation in C uh, to a C++ implementation, which he called libpmem oj <laughs> obj++, which um, gave closure to transactions, but it ended up being you know much much more brief and and worked out a whole lot better. Um, he did ask one basically existential question, mm -hmm. though. He said, yeah. "What?" Who knows what SETJMP -E open paren, closed paren is? I wrestled with that for the rest of the day. <laughs> Stephen Bates wasn't here for that. Let's see, that, the, the name of the guy I'm trying to remember now. Melind. Yeah, Melind. Melind. He, he, yes. he, he spoke, oh yeah, it was down here. Melind and Scott Shadley, the two of them uh, covered for him. Um, now, Stephen would have used very colorful language had he been here, but I think that Melind did a very good job when he talked about CXL mem uh, being uh, used for SPM via UEFI in a framing format with ACPI for HFAT. And what that means, of course, that first of all, that Stephen Bates was channeled by uh, Meland and Scott, and we felt they did a, uh, with their Ouija board, they did a good job of that. Yeah, it was like he was here. It was. I almost felt the F word. But cleaner, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, trifecta uh, is NVMe. Uh, the trifecta he's talking about is NVMe, CLX, and persistent memory together. CXL. CX. Oh, I did say that. CXL. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, he said there was widespread processor uh, vendor support and, and CXL dynamically uh, multiplexes IO, cache, and memory. And Scott Shadley, like Charles Fan, needs a name. <laughs> you. Ah, sorry. So uh, Dave Eggleston was next. Uh, yeah. And he gave a great plug for Jim's reports there. Uh, he talked about media attachment and usage. And um, so part of this is the heterogeneous FRAM has to be used with a, uh, properly with an open CAPI, but just in case there's some kind of uh, uh, re, uh, capacitance issues, need to high, day, uh, high K dielectric, um, that is uh, also informed by the local scuttlebutt. In case you didn't understand what Tom was just saying, what it means is that the future of DRAM is DRAM. He also wanted to say that, that we love and hate persistent memories. They're, they're 
the best of things or the worst of things. Yes. Um, but if the network is fast enough, which he you know, reiterated what Andy Bechtelsheim said, is you don't have to worry about where the data resi resides. Um, you can use pooled memory, and uh, you know the pooled memory was mentioned before in the Intel talk. It was it mentioned later on in other talks. Pooled memory appears to be where it's at. We all want to dive into the pooled memory. Yeah. So the next was Pratap Subramaniam, who uh, was uh, talking about persistent memory in uh, Gul Golang, which uh, that was new to Tom and me. We it didn't was. realize that the Lang part stood for language. Um, but you know, he, he spoke you know, very succinctly about mem tiers on zero day using fat pointers mm. to avoid chattiness and try to provide chat or crash consistency. And of course, what Jim means uh, is that he mentioned the difficulty of understanding crashes, uh, as did uh, Intel's uh, Piotr uh, Balser. Um, he put an entire key value store in persistent memory and found that that gave him advantages. And uh, his program built using Go language with a custom Go compiler, hence the Go lang. Um, and a persistent memory provided improved performance, he found. Uh, but without the compiler, it was, uh, it was overall a very unpleasant experience. I thought he was saying Golem some of the time there. You think so? Golem, Golem? Okay. okay. Now, uh, Jai Shi gave a very interesting talk on Exadata with uh, persistent memory, an epic journal. And it was epic because the OLTP sailed along on the elastic PM log buffers going forth through the channel of the network ACK. I, I hope Tom didn't lose you there, but what he was talking about has, is that every Exadata server, uh, is storage server, uses 1.5 terabytes of persistent memory. And uh, they were using what she called the dynamic duo of persistent memory and RDMA to achieve 16 million IOPS in 19 microsecond latency. That's 320 times what the Exadata had uh, 10 years earlier mm -hmm. in its first uh, instantiation. The uh, persistent memory cache was read using RDMA. Uh, and that was the key enabler for this because it got past an awful lot of the latency problems mm -hmm. uh, that you have going through normal uh, storage or communications protocol. Um, she talked twice about sandwiches. There was yes. a sandwich between the top server and the bottom server in the rack where the uh, communications, the RDMA uh, things were, but, but also talked about how PMEM is sandwiched between DRAM and uh, the, the NAND flash. Mm -hmm. And e even though I had this really wonderful SNEA lunch outside, it made me hungry. So <laughs> anyway, uh, she had a good way of describing how things work that way. And we're glad that she was able to come and talk this year because her boss finally let her out of her cage because she has a released product. Indeed. Now the next speaker was Yao Wei, um, who uh, is with Twitter and seemed to be talking about birds an awful lot, a lot of birds. Uh, with Pelican uh, on the ADP. And the way that she described it was by saying that there was a cuckoo in the Pelican with a canary. And that ended up causing the QPS to have a slab and a zipless S array with a TWEM cache. Now, what Jim means here is that a Twitter cache has small and wimpy clusters. Um, also, memory mode is boring, but direct app mode is less boring. Um, she said, don't trust anybody else's network, so keep that in benchmarks. 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 Yeah. Keep that in mind. Memory mode is a good gateway drug, something we all should remember. <laughs> And if you tweet enough, you will tweet on persistent memory. And seven years on call made her focus on potential problems. Probably a good thing for everyone to try. So Jim Pfister um, talked about uh, persistent memory hackathons. And um, he threw some pearls out to us. Um, but there were three misses. I couldn't catch any of them. Uh, but I did do my uh, NVMW. and. Uh, so yeah, and you know Tom couldn't go on with too many buzzwords because Jim didn't use too. He many didn't use buzzwords. enough. <laughs> no. But but what Tom means to say is that even the dumbest blind manager in the world can do a PM hackathon. Yes. So we're looking for somebody who's got that on their resume. <laughs> Um, we need more hackathons in more places, and uh, uh, if you want to send an email to pmhackathon at snea.org, you can get on that list, send that resume that says that you're blind and dumb. And uh, the organization, he, he spoke about the organization formerly known as SSSI. Twice. 
Yeah, yeah. And so I guess that's somebody else who needs a name. You know, I guess, well, you know, that's another name. Yes, before. Names yeah, yeah. And so, so we, we need a namer here. Um, but uh, what was the most interesting thing about names was that we found out that in Perl, one of the P's is silent. So Eden Kim came on. Why did I get stuck with this one? <laughs> Saying real world workloads. I said it, but I can't say that three times in a row. <laughs> anyway, so the way that he described it to us is that you use the LSTM to test out your DCPMM or NVDM, um, or even an XFlash SSD uh, under a dearth phenomenon, which is, uh, uses lost streams. IO streams. Oh, that's IO stream. Yes, yes. Ah, okay. Oh, and so, and then what I else? can't read your handwriting. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's typed. Now he showed us workload types and how to capture them, and he captured workloads in the wild and said that you can too. Um, and again, the uh, wild ones taste better. They do taste better. They are, yeah. They're a little gamier. <laughs> um, and again, can you say real world workloads three times? So, uh, our last uh, last speaker here was. Uh, uh, Yafe Yang, who talked uh, also about real world, real world workloads. <laughs> he took as LX Flash, but put it beneath a hidden layer. But, but, it, but his recurrent neural net found the Q, uh, QOS OFT, OTF management. <laughs> and what Tom means to say by that is that Yafe's uh, talk showed good matches between I.O. predictions that were done by his uh, AI machine um, and what really happened in real life. And in performance, uh, his performance tuning was done better in hardware than in software. And I don't know if you really noticed, but in that table that he showed, it was like a thousand to one difference mm -hmm. in the uh, speed of the software development versus the hardware. And you know, you got 95% accuracy versus 80%, so I'm going to go buy one. <laughs> and he's looking for collaboration and partnerships in this area. So with that. Yeah, that's, that's our summary of this. And I, oh, I give him a hand. That was great. <laughs> All right, two more thank yous. Um, so uh, just briefly, and I know she's already left because uh, she was deathly ill today, but uh, um, Jenny Dietz was responsible for pulling this conference together. Um, she led the team, made sure that everything was on time, worked her tail off on it. Even if she's not here, maybe she's watching the video or she'll watch it later. So let's all give her a big hand. I was hoping to get more laughter. Oh, and so, good, and since she's not here, I'll say we're so impressed we're going to give it to her for the next 10 years because if she doesn't see this, she might actually approve my expenses next month. Okay, uh, thank you all for coming, for being patient, for soaking up the information, and for contributing to a wonderful PM Summit. We will see you next year. Have, uh, and more importantly, we'll see you in, uh, out in the hallway for the reception. Thank you.